Welcome to Adeptus On Air, the show where we examine how individuals and companies make decisions that drive their business and personal success. Each week, we connect with notable professionals who pull back the curtain on the industries that Adeptus has been on the cutting edge of for the last 30 years, including music, sports, and entertainment, as well as new emerging markets. Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Adeptus on Air. I'm your host again, Mike Hoffman. Today, I am joined by the CEO of Battle Island, PJ Achitoro. PJ, how you doing? Hey, Mike. How are you today? Good to be here. And more importantly, I got your name right, right? You did. You did. I know. The Italian uh, double C is always fun, but cappuccino, Achitoro, it's been good. Thank good. you so much for having me on today. No, it, it was so so glad to have you. You know, doing a little studying on you and your company, and you know, I, I find it pretty fascinating. Kind of, you know, your vision for what you're doing now and the vision of the future. So I kind of want to, you know, cover all that. But what I like yeah, to I do can, with everyone is I kind of. God, I'm sorry. God. Yeah, I was. I can give you like a nut nutshell of why your your listeners should care about me. You know, that's yeah. Kill. Yeah. And when we get there, I also like to know how we got to where we are today. So kind of, you, you you filled me in briefly before, but kind of tell me you know, your story and how we kind of arrived, uh, you know, at where we are now. Yeah. I mean, in a, in a nutshell, two and a half years ago, I was driving for Uber today. We have a huge TV show, which is going to launch and got some of the biggest stars on the planet, like Justin Long and Rosario Dawson. And, you know, working with some of my favorite actors that I idolized growing up. And instead of me being a, you know, production assistant on the show, I'm, you know, CEO of the studio, uh, that's, you know, is, is running and putting it together. So it has been a crazy two and a half year journey, 10, you know, 10 to 20 years in the making all overnight successes yeah. are. And so I just, you know, excited to share more about our story. Cause I think there's a lot of takeaways for uh, young entrepreneurs, uh, you know, just people who love good stories. That's what we're all about right. here. Yep. Well, clearly growing up, your career ambition was not to be an Uber driver. So you obviously had some <laughs> other plans. And as everyone does, we need to somehow pay the bills. Yep. And, you know, a lot of people supplement it with things like Uber. So, you know, as you're doing that, you obviously have this vision in play, you know, for obviously maybe not exactly where you are now, but to get to where you are now. So talk about the evolution of you said 10 years in the making, but really two years ago you were an Uber driver. So kind of talk about the last 10 years and more specifically the last two years, how we're, you know, where we are now. Sure, sure. Well, let's 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 kind of start back in the beginning. I think all great entrepreneurship journeys are started with childhood trauma, right? We uh, that's okay. where ambition comes from. Is you know you're running from yeah. something, or it's an identity about uh-huh. yourself that you don't quite believe in and want to prove to the world. And so, you know, I I grew up not maybe I there was a lot of really amazing things about my home and the school that I was a part of, but a lot of ways into which I felt most safe when I was kind of like overseas and out getting just kind of escaping to find myself elsewhere and to tell stories. We did a lot of humanitarian nonprofit work. And when I was in high school, I got to go on these over summer trips where we do medical stuff. Um, And I I found that like rather than swinging hammers to build orphanages, actually having a a camera and really telling stories was the greatest point of leverage because storytelling, you know, it's like the pen's mightier than the sword. Um, that yeah. is our greatest gift, I think, in, in many ways, and those from like first world countries, is being able to go down and share stories and be that bridge between those who have means and those who don't have means and able to tell the mm-hmm. amazing work. So that was kind of the first 10 years of my life from like 15 to 25 is doing photojournalism. I got uh, right place, right time. We're just out of high school. I moved to West Africa, worked on this hospital ship. Wow. National Geographic came out second day. Their photographer got sick and I was the ship's photojournalist. That at that point, uh, I got published in National Geographic at 18, and you know that's where things really started to snowball. Where um, I just realized the power in telling stories that matter, the impact that it could have of people who had tumors, people who had leprosy, people who have cataracts, all getting kind of like healed in short time span, and that's it. Just it was so gratifying for that first 10 years of becoming a storyteller, right? Plus, I imagine it had to be so eye-opening because you grew up in Florida. Yep. And now suddenly you're in Africa. Yep. And in addition to seeing these things, you're just seeing a whole new world because everything is completely different, yes. I have to imagine, than what you're used to. Yeah, and I think I think it's really important for young people to be able to get out and get the broader view of like what is the common experience around the world? What is the human experience around the world? Because we get in these bubbles to where it's just so easy to 
take for granted, you know, all of the sort of things that we view as normal and the rat race of getting a car and keeping up with the Joneses. Like, you know, there's there's a balance of perspective that I think is really helpful yeah. in the formative years of everyone to get overseas. Well, it's funny. We're not even talking about that. But when you refer to the concept of normal, you know, I, I've always found that that term, what's normal? Well, what's normal for me is definitely not normal for you. And we right. basically both grew up on the East Coast. But Hell, Florida normal is different than New Jersey normal. And then what's normal for me today might not be normal a month from now because my situations would have changed. So to me, normal is basically just, to me, what one person's feeling at one time. Right. Because my normal is going to be different tomorrow. Yeah. 100%. 100%. And so, yeah, it it really just informed, you know, like a a kind of a life's calling or a vocation of, you know, I, I knew that. Telling stories um, provided a sense of purpose, but also a sense of impact and contribution. And I think life is, you know, happiness in life is found when you're the thing that you that feels natural to you and the thing you're good at and the opportunities that are around you kind of converge into, you know, this sense of uh, the, your reason for living, so to say, as the Japanese right. would, would say. I think it's called ikigai, the term in Japanese. So that's... The, the good news and the bad news about documentary work is it can be really gratifying. On the other hand, uh, it's, it doesn't pay for crap. <laughs> it really, sure, sure. You, can't, well, you can't quite build a life doing it or raise a family doing it or all that kind of stuff. And around that time, I had met my wife and um, you know, we really wanted to figure out like what we, we, had, we had both done nonprofit work. Like she, she, she would go to Thailand to work with women in the red light district nice. and teach them how to do uh, like – cut hair as like an alternate vocation and so i mean she was always really passionate about it too but it also was really draining and you know we we had no savings we had you know we just given our lives uh for most of our 20s to nonprofits. that honestly going to um the corporate side and turning those same skills into commercials and film Mm -hmm. was a easy transition and honestly a bit refreshing just because it we finally felt like we could um sort of get rest for our for our lives in the first time. And that's that's something people don't always yeah. talk about with the nonprofit world is it's kind of glamorized, but people don't really realize how much burnout there is. Um, yeah. And you can't yeah. always talk about it, right? Yeah. And when you're talking the nonprofit work and the type of work you were doing, as you said, you weren't making a ton of money. Mm-hmm. You weren't doing it all for the money. You were doing it for the humanitarian side of it. Right. So then now you, you, you're transitioning in your life with your marriage now and so forth. And now, as you said, you're turning it into a business. Yep. So what was that moment like when you said, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is how, this is now my plan going forward, but we're not only going to do it because we love doing it. We're also going to do it because this is what's going to support us. A hundred percent. I mean, it's along those lines. I don't think that things at life oftentimes come in like extreme 180 changes. A lot of times Correct. I think it's just more of like you're phasing out of one season of your life and you're mm-hmm. headed to a new season in life. And so I, you know, I realized that there was just a lot more, even freedom with volunteering my time for nonprofits. Once I had done a big commercial gig and that paid for me to have a month off afterwards to then work on passion projects, work with nonprofits mm-hmm. rather than just always be burning the candle at both ends. So, so that's when I, I really realized the power in leveraged work, um, you know, mm-hmm. really just figuring out how do you provide very high value uh, services in, you know, in, in my case, commercial video production, you know, cause that's, you know, storytelling at its max. Um, I, I did, bunch of commercial work for uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the uh, Atlanta Braves, um, a bunch of, you know, Tampa based businesses Mm -hmm. as well. Um, And at the same time, though, you really have to not get in the grind for the grind sake or money for money's sake. And so I really was trying to figure out, is there a way like all artists when they're kids, you know, they they dream of making a movie or a TV show. Yeah. You know, Mm -hmm. that certainly was like, man, I I really want to figure out how do we get to that summit. And uh, a happy detour that we took was, long story short, one of my dad's videos, he's like a internet voiceover actor where you can book him for videos and and voiceovers. Crazy. He was on this website called Fiverr. Anyway, one of his videos went viral. Talking tens of millions of views in the space of like a week. And I was like, holy crap. And it actually caused, it went so viral that Fiverr like banned him from the platform. He lost his livelihood because it was like a funny script about John Wick uh, needing your credit card number for kids and Fortnite and like the gaming community just loved it. They're like, ah, pay to win John Wick, blah, blah, blah. It was a big YouTube thing. And, and so then he got kicked off and I was like, dad, you gotta, 
you got to figure out a way to get income. Your livelihood mm -hmm. just got taken away. Why don't we turn to like the yeah. internet, which apparently loves you. Let's start a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. So he's like, all right. So we started a YouTube channel, told the internet, like he just got, you know, let go from Fiverr because you guys messed up his memes, you know, you guys blew, <laughs> you, him, up. You guys blew him up. <laughs> yeah. Like you're responsible. Fix this. Yeah. Give him livelihood. Not, not that seriously, but, uh, it, anyway, the, the, the community was really awesome. They're like, all right, you know, like you make videos, we'll watch them kind of in a, an essential arrangement yeah. where we just started making more videos. And by the end of that first week, we had like 300, 400,000 subscribers on, on YouTube, the end of six months, as we were making multiple videos a week for six, we, we had a million subscribers in six months. So it was mayhem it was the best of times and the worst of times right because here's like all young people today will say i want to be a youtuber when i grow up right and i'm here to tell them yeah. it sucks if you don't have the right channel the right process the right boundaries because even yeah. like it's this endless content grind we're from my world well, I'll, I'll spend a month making a commercial and the same with with these yeah. youtube videos and then the audience watches it and it's like a 10 minute video and they're like that's amazing i want one tomorrow and they they like oh, expect yeah. that daily content grind so yeah that was yeah. so difficult but also really fulfilling and uh we met some really big youtubers and that that was kind of the platform though i was able to launch into my hollywood career afterwards which now I, what I, kind I, of content were you putting out like you talked about the content video what was games your content? memes stuff for kids like actually my dad he he would do these things called dad talks too where like he'd be like cleaning his pool at the start of the video and then he'd sit down and like have that father-son conversation that yeah. we had growing up with him and you know he kind of had it to the audience like he would get his community to have like hey you know like my friends are calling me gay or like i don't know you know like i don't have a dad what would you say to me like all all these kind of problems that kids were yeah. like just kind of talking about and then he would give this kind of fatherly advice and it it, it really did well so he uh he continued to do it but when the pandemic hit um we weren't able to like get together in person to shoot as much and sure. i just told him like i'm, I'm kind of burnt out uh, of of this youtube channel um take it i mean it's yours and um he went to mm -hmm play video games full time, keep doing his content. And I, I was able to step away for the first time and actually figure out like, what is my artistic vision? What, what do I kind of add value to the world? What can no one else do? And I, and I realized I was playing a lot of video games like Fortnite, like these battle Royale games. And I was also, you know, I'm, I'm a YouTube to creator. I'm a content creator. So the, the, the creation of our story was about that 30 years from now. It's like, what happens when we go from virtual reality where you put on these headsets to yeah. actual matrix like neural reality where it, it goes in through your nervous system and you actually experience this game on a neurological level as if it's reality, because that's happening. Like Elon Musk already has Neuralink. It's, it's, it's hundred percent the future of video games. And so mm -hmm. my, I would, I had a writing partner at the time. Um, he was working at a mental health hospital in the daytime. He would come back home with like black eyes and like these kids would go in and like to the mental health hospital, not like not understanding what was real and what wasn't real because they would have such intense PTSD from whatever happened on the outside. And that added a new layer to our story that we were creating of, okay, if these games in the future will feel like they're real, what happens when you have some traumatic circumstance that happens in the game that you're not able, once you come back to like real life and unplug from the game, yeah. you're, you're, our minds aren't built to handle that that duality, right. it's, it's going to yeah. believe that that was a real trauma that happened to us. And so that was what I think really went, made us go deep down the rabbit hole of like, okay, it starts off a bit of like Hunger Games meets a Battle Royale, but really it, it gets into Jurassic Park and it gets into the kind of Stranger Things like aspects of there's a monster in it and, and that's what's causing these kids to go crazy. So it's a it's a very fun, little bit of scary uh you know, script that we were writing. And of course the big question is, okay, we, so we wrote the script. What the heck do you do with it now? I, you know, I knew, right. I knew how YouTube worked. I knew how documentaries worked, but I didn't know how Hollywood worked. And so I started just, I don't know. I don't know if you remember clubhouse, but I was in all these clubhouse rooms talking to different producers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I worked my way up to Tom Cruise's producer after I pitched every single day, like the, the script. And uh, he's like, all right, yeah. kid, listen to you. I like your moxie. He was like old, 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 old Italian dude. He's like, I like I your moxie, all, yeah. But he's like, 
And he's like, you got to shut up about this blockbuster idea because he's like, you're a nobody. And the only way for someone to produce your script is for you to have a big name or like – but you can't do this film. This this film's like a Ready Player One $50 million budget. It's not a good first project. Just can it. This movie will never get made right. until you become someone. Who's going who's gonna to fund a no name a $50 no, million dollar cool. project, right? And, and here's what I say as a producer now. Like he was absolutely right. I, and, right but it was soul crushing to hear that. Um, and you know, I, t- I took a bunch of months off and I, you know, I, I, that's, that's when I really started driving, um, for Uber and whatnot. And just tr- just trying to figure out like, what the heck do I do with my life? Like I, I felt in some ways, like my YouTube channel was a bit of a failure in that I couldn't sustain it. It wasn't quite profitable. Um, I felt like my Hollywood dreams were a failure and I was burned out of nonprofit. So it really was like a dark yeah. night of the soul for me yeah. about two and a half years ago. And you have like strike one, strike two, strike three. We yep. have all three things. Yeah. Oh yeah, and my marriage was on the ringer. To um, you know, my wife's just like, look, you gotta fi- you gotta figure out not just like your career, but also what makes you happy because you're miserable mm-hmm. and you're just you're coping with video games and like you're coping with anything but being present. And she was yeah. she was right. So um, the the kind of turn in the story is the, I don't know if you remember this was like a big tech entertainment trend, but there was something called the metaverse about. Yes. In 2021, right after the pandemic, yep. Facebook rebranded from Facebook to Meta, and everyone was talking Meta. about like what's the future of entertainment, virtual reality, and all this craziness. So that was a bit of our story, the essence of our story, right? We're talking about teenagers who go into a game and experience yeah. it like it's real life. And so I, I realized if there was one time in human history in which an unknown writer and an unknown name IP – could actually have a shot at getting a large budget behind it. It was around the metaverse hype, um, just because mm-hmm. you know Meta's dumping in billions of dollars in. Oh, billions! Oh yeah, billions of dollars. They they actually spent more than the NASA space program did to get to the moon. Oh. <laughs> They're like, it's like holy cow! That's yeah. a that's a lot of that's a that's a pretty big a one. A lot of cheddar. Um, so I went to a bunch of uh, uh, the different tech conferences, and I was just trying to find like. Who's trying to tell stories about the future of entertainment? Who is? And it, it finally, I'm down on my last dollar at this point. It's the end of 2021. And I'm in this uh, Miami tech conference. And there's this guy on stage that uh, is, he goes, hey, I'm, you know, I'm with Gala Games. I just made, uh, we just made a billion dollars as a company this year alone in Web3 Gaming. And, you know, we, we, we really want to tell stories about the future of, enge- of, 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 of entertainment. And, uh, you know, we're launching a film platform next year. So if anyone, you know, wants to talk more about that, let's talk. And I was like, oh, my God, this is like, <laughs> this is my guy. This is this. This is the moment. Yeah. And I go backstage and he's not there. Like I'm running, sprinting, looking like a madman. Like, where the hell does this guy go? So I started asking around. They're like, oh, yeah, he's at the like exclusive. Like he's going to the party tonight. It's his Watch last it. night in town. Yeah, yeah it's like. But only is like only millionaires and tech billionaires yeah. are like can get into this. Like you got no shot, kid. And I was like, fuck. So I, I find out roughly where in, in Miami it was. And I just kind of drive there and I'm driving like like a Honda that's like probably wouldn't make it back home. <laughs> like this thing was a beater. I'm out of gas, out of money, like out of hope. You hear it coming from a mile away. Totally. Chugging up the road. And I look. Yeah, I like kind of pass by the security gate up front. It's like guys with yeah. guns and like big gates and stuff yeah. like that. So I, was like, I drive around back like. I'm, I'm trying to climb this, you know, like just to get into this party. It's like 15 foot hall wall. Can't get in. Try and go in the service entrance as like a waiter. They like kick me out. And I'm just like another dark night of the soul. I call my wife. I'm going to head back. This is like no way I can get in. What a, what a naive fool I am. Right. And all of a sudden I hear this like big car engine. Like woo woo. And it's this huge red Lamborghini that pulls up. And this guy's like, hey, man, do you know how to get into the party? Like, and I was like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on the other side. You didn't get the invite. And he's like, oh, I'm so dumb. He's like, can you actually just show me where it is? And I was like, sure. Like, he's like, okay, well, come on, hop in. So I get in his Lamborghini, like the most handsome Miami guy you've ever seen. He's got the Cuban right, right. hat. It's, 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 it's like yeah. wearing all white. I'm looking like I could pass for a waiter. You look like you just got out of your Honda. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sweating because it's Florida. And it's freaking hot. Yeah. Um, and so instead of like him just dropping me off at the front, like – 
thanks for the info. He takes me like we just go inside, and and he just thought I was part of the party. So I was like, yeah, I'll just roll with it. So the you know the Falcon doors open up as we step out, and I lock eye contact as we step out with the Gala Games guy. And now he's like he thinks I'm hot stuff. So I walk up to him. Yeah. I go, hey, my name's PJ. I was so impressed with your talk earlier, and I have a story about the future of entertainment. It would be the perfect film to launch in your platform. Let's talk next week. And he's like, done, done. And so we talked that next week and I, I pitched him the story and he's like, yeah, let's great. Let's do it. What do you need? Like how much does it cost? <laughs> it's like, oh my God. Ah, what? 50 million. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the reality is he said as a live action, it's going to cost too much. So we ended up repivoting the project to be an animated series, like anime style. Okay. And that, that was the sweet spot where we could get all of that like mainstream production value and tell it the story the right way, but not have it break the bank. Um, and so, gosh, man, it, I mean, it, here's, here's how life uh, in success works is it's like you spend your whole life chasing one thing. And then the moment you get it, it's not like, I mean, celebrate and be happy. And, but then your problems get 10 times bigger and yeah. 10 times crazier. That's just when it, that's just when it starts. That's, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was – Yeah. That was nuts. We um, And then basically that was about a year, year and a half ago. And since then, it's really just been building the team and the mad dash mm-hmm. it takes to create a TV show. And we're, we've been so blessed – we um, we work with a Marvel writer who wrote uh, for you know uh, the Avengers and DC oh. and you know yeah. Batman series and um, and he's so he's you're getting some serious cred behind you. Hundred percent. You're getting these people who have been out there. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's actually you know if you if if you want a tip or a takeaway, it's like uh, you can be inexperienced, and I'm I'm super insecure, but at the same time, I really try and lean into my like, look, I'm a big happy idiot, but I'm the guy who's never going to stop not only just like pursuing this, but also building the team of experts and, you know, sort of the wizards, if you will, the Obi-Wan Kenobis and the Gandalfs, because together it's such a powerful dynamic to have, you know, this sort of old mentors and the young talent working together to create something new. So, so sorry. So now you're starting to build your team, as you said, and you obviously have gotten some big names associated with the project. So yeah, how did, how did that come about? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the great news about Hollywood is you can get some great actors if you got the cash to back it up. And uh, the, the good news on top of that, too, is that anime is something that's really hot right now. Like 10 years ago, you know, adults didn't watch animated stuff. It was all kids. But now with the, you know, Japanese anime just becoming such a cultural phenomenon for teenagers yeah. these days, we're, we're, we had, you know, some really big, it's not like we had big budgets to pay our actors, but like actors like Rosario Dawson, who's got a huge series. She's the lead in a Star Wars show coming out this year. She was like, yeah, I'll do it. And I'll do it for, you know, like a, a pretty affordable rate for us. And then once all the other actors are like, oh, Rosario's on this, like, cool. We got Justin Long. We've right. got, um, Tony Revolori, we've got a big K-pop star from Korea. Like we've got some awesome, awesome cast members now, and we're working with Hans Zimmer's team for the music. Like, uh, wow, he's got a music studio called Bleeding Fingers Music, where it's about twenty composers in house that have kind of taken his legacy, his training, and then he's able to now scale to do a lot more uh, shows and projects through this sort of school or co- collective. Um, and they're so nice. So we are. Uh, when, when does this episode come out? Because I think tomorrow we're announcing that we're going to Comic Con. But if it's not being released tomorrow, we I can say it here. We're going to Comic Con next. Yes. Next. It's not being released tomorrow. Okay, so <laughs> great. I figured <laughs> you'd be a god yeah. if you could turn these around in a no. day. <laughs> yeah, no. My yeah. team's good. Not that good. Yeah, 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 yeah. No. Yeah. no. Um, so yeah, we're, uh, we're. What's crazy is because of the writers' strike, um, we're. Ooh we're taking uh like the prime time spot this is this never would have opened wow. up and uh yeah i mean we don't we don't like our our show won't even be ready for a while and yet we're going to be on stage at noon uh in in two weeks uh, at comic con with our wow. actors and it's just been one of those like cinderella stories like i said before that like it's it's almost like reality is stranger than fiction or re- yeah yeah like yeah. reality is stranger yeah. than fiction like it feels surreal to be telling this story like i'm kind of oh, doubtful yeah. like did this really happen like no 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 like well, it's me ago, I, the story like, I don't I believe my own happen. story because it's crazy yeah. but yeah yeah i mean it's i don't know what to say other than like 
I think momentum is a huge thing in life. And I think that's mm-hmm. why it's really important once you hit some of your milestones or your goals, like you can't let your foot off the gas and like celebrate right. and rest and all that kind of stuff. Don't like toxically like, cause our YouTube channel, like I grown myself to the bone. So find ways to get rest. But I, I do mm-hmm. think that if you, and we talked about this before the call, but if you have like 100 X opportunities and 100 X vision, it gets people mm-hmm. so much more excited than having two X vision. Like the yeah. irony is that sometimes raising $2 million is harder than raising a, a startup for 10 million or a hundred million dollars. Oh yeah. Because people are interested in like the, the big flashy, sexy stuff. They're not always interested in like, you know, 10%, you know, return on their money over a year as much as they are like the next AI, you know, or the next X, Y, Z tech idea that could change everything. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, mm-hmm. Yeah. I was going to say, cause I think we're, our, our networks are struggling here a little bit. Uh, yep. I think you know, more people, especially these investors in Hollywood or things like that, the hundred X is something they're going to take a moment to listen to, but they're not going to waste their time on a two X. So yeah. why it's, it, you could say it's easier to get to two X. It's maybe not easier to get to two X because you're eliminating a lot of people that wouldn't even, waste their time on a, on a, on a 2x it's 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 true and it's a balance like i said like if you're an outsider like no one's gonna do a 100x venture quite with you but that's why i think partnerships are really instrumental mm-hmm. and like i said like yes. the first hire we had for our project was um you know our marvel showrunner who adds just all the credibility in the world yeah. um his name's mike ryan i hate calling him marvel showrunner because he he's a ghost of ruin showrunner so excuse me um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. we, we've just each step of the way. I think, I think if you're in any sort of high growth spot in life, you need mentors, you need people, you know, so that, uh, I have two other partners, yeah. Michael and Katie, who are our producers. They've made, you know, they've worked on shows like the bachelor and all the big, um, shows before. And so mm-hmm. just having them as mentors, guide stones, and, you know, in many ways they run our company more than I do as the CEO, just because I think the, mm-hmm. the trick as a CEO is just to figure out, um, how do I create a vision that people want to get behind? And then how do I get the heck out of their way? Because I can yeah. get in the way of the process of doing these things. But I, as, as visionary leaders, you know, it's, it's up to us yep. to find what, what's that big idea that, that the market hasn't seen yet and the need is there and no one's been able to do. But we know we can kind of figure out a way to disrupt yep. all these big players through this kind of small A team, if you will, to, to yeah, disrupt. There, yep. When you're talking leadership, you know, and you know, I've studied it a decent amount, you know, reading some books and, you know, courses and so forth over time, a good leader, like you said, has the vision in some cases, but doesn't know the best way to execute that vision. Yep. So you bring in these people who have the experience or a skill set that you don't have. You're right. Effective leadership at times is taking two steps to the left and letting someone run past you 100%. and take your idea you know, and a bad leader sometimes is the one who thinks I have to do everything and everything yeah. that anyone else does has to run by me. And some of that minutia, you don't need to know about. You need to know that we're on track to that vision. We're planning certain things and we collaborate, we talk, we discuss, but hey, you go, you go. And, you know, we'll, 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 meet, we'll meet up yeah. here when we get to this next level. And that's effective leadership. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think, I think the irony of leadership too, is that, uh, every, everyone likes to think of these big bombastic, like gorilla, biggest gorilla in the room, like ego centric, uh, you know, sort of leaders is the ones that are the most effective. I think it can look that way on the surface, but the, the irony is that like, I think in some ways it's, it's the leaders who have the most humility to actually understand it's not about them. It's a, it's first mm-hmm. and foremost about the vision of how you can the serve, vision. how you can serve your customers, your audience, the world, your employees that actually comes mm-hmm. first and foremost. And so you got to get out of the way of your own vision because everyone is, gets in alignment with that vision. And then you're not the most important person in the company, really like you're, you're you, the servant, yeah. you're the, you're, you're the steward of that vision. It's, it's like, you you're, know, it's like, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You just said what I think sums it up perfectly. You have a vision. Once your team buys into that vision and believes in that vision, and now it's like I said, it's not just yours or your company's. It's now all of your people's vision. Yep. I just think at that point, the results just take off, you know, 
Like you can't even imagine at that point in time. Yeah, and I and, 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 and there's a it's lot also of like a good leader, like you said, is having right. your staff buy into that vision. Yes, and 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 it's and it's it's really important for our companies to outlive us or the vision behind it to outlive us because there's a lot of companies that are based on the cult of the persuasive personality. Um, at the top and then something happens in their personal life they have some big affair they say the wrong thing in the media and then it really yeah. causes a crumbling of the sort of integrity of that brand um and yep. it, i think it's i think it's more important to have the sort of vision where it's it's or the the brand where it's not just contingent on everyone's loyalty to the creator and and I'll say this with a calendar balance, though, that in, in today's day and age, the, some of the strongest brands are based around creators like, uh, for instance, Ryan Reynolds and Dwayne Johnson have grown billion dollar um, alcohol companies in, in the space of a year or, you know, yeah. and, and, and in, in, in that way, I think that people do want pers- like the humanity, this aspect that some of these big brands are run by real people. That's kind of the new trend of advertising is, you know, authenticity is, is really king. But at the same time, you have to balance that with if your whole business is based around you and your persona, what happens when you have to step out for a medical reason or you get acquired and it has to be another face of your brand? Yeah, and, and a lot of business right now is getting your business as valuable as you can. Right. To sell it. 100%. And, you know, a lot of what we do is, you know, a lot of our businesses, that's kind of their objective. You know, I'm dealing with a client right now in the uh, medical space, psycholo- you know, psychological services. And all they're doing right now is bringing more doctors, more doctors in telehealth with the objective to get to this dollar point so they can sell it to a bigger conglomerate. So right. while providing quality service now, they're not looking at building this vision for 20 years. Their vision is very short term to get that big payout. And you yeah. do see it a lot in entertainment. You see, you know, companies sucked up by some of the bigger ones. Yeah, and I and I think that's a that's a tough balance because in I th- I think in many ways the businesses that are thriving the most right now are the ones that have a bit of long term vision to say we're here yep. not to like you know have the the highest margins in the business. We're here to actually create a customer experience that's in unparalleled. Um, and some of my favorite shoes that I'm buying right now, clothing, apparel, like a lot of brands, again, aren't, um, it's, it's brands that I feel like are, are creating a relationship with me. Like I wake up to wanting to consume their content because I love the content creators they're doing, or I just love the kind of like pathos and the vision for the sustainability of it. And so I think that it's, it's important even when our goal is an acquisition, like I'm, you know, it's not like I'm opposed to that for our studio and for our show and stuff like that. But I think that it's, it's not, obviously that's not a public facing thing. And even internally with the team, it's like, look, we're, we're here to create good in and good out. Like we know that if we're having fun working on this project, not, not that we don't have some hard days, but if, if we're here creating yeah. a story that really creates a relationship with our audience and a community that they can't get anywhere else, um, it's, it's going to drive revenue. It's going to drive a higher acquisition target. Right. It's going to do all those things. Mm-hmm. But that's kind of a downstream byproduct of the process just being great and exceptional, right? So when do you think, now going more specifically back to this project, when do you think this will be out to the public? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we are still circling um, sort of definitive deadlines. Um, the end of the year, we should have kind of part one of our show out tentatively. Again, that can be subject to change. We're also talking with different streamers right now on what particular platform it's uh, mm-hmm. best launched on. Uh, our, our partner company, Gala Gala Games and Gala Film, um, certainly is where they can find it. But we're also talking to big streamers on like the, 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 the global distribution of it, like a potential... Netflix, Amazon, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's the aspect of it that isn't the creative side. Now we're talking the business side, which, you know, yeah. to be a CEO of that kind of company, think about think about in the past two minutes what you've talked about. There's two totally different hats that you need to wear. <laughs> oh, now we're talking, yeah. you need a creative vision. Dude. You, you don't have a product without the creative vision. Now that you have that, it's okay. Yeah. What about now is the creative vision means nothing if no one's going to see it. <laughs> yes. And that that's what's been honestly the hardest road of all of this is it's like I, not, not that telling the story was easy, but at the end of the day, like scripts are commodities. 
Um, yeah. You know, honestly, execution and, and the strategic sense of the business partnerships and all that in some ways plays a bigger part in the success. And that's that's been a really hard adjustment because all artists think they're going to be artists until the end of the time. And then you realize the leverage point that comes when you can actually more step into the entrepreneurship where you can hire artists yeah. that share your vision. And now you're able to 10x, 100x because you're not right. contained to where I'm not writing scripts anymore. Even though I wrote the first script, I'm not writing scripts anymore. I'm not in creative meetings anymore. And I, I think you need to mourn the loss of that from an artistic side, but you need to say, mm-hmm. I can, again, I can serve this vision greater if I'm not keeping it down because I'm micromanaging or for the sake of my ego, I have to be in these writer's rooms or I have to make decisions about the universe. We've got some of the best storytellers on the planet at this point on this project. Right. So I can trust that they're sort of in more in tune with the story than I am now. And I have to have the humility to say, but I'm needed in the partnerships department, in the marketing department, mm-hmm. in you know, in right. strategically all these other business ventures. That's been a hard transition. It really has. So in a perfect world now, this goes according to plan. You, you find your streaming partner. It comes out. Yep. Last question I'm going to ask you is if you could set a perfect next five to ten years, you know, for Battle Island, for maybe this, this concept, maybe franchise or so forth like that. I know things evolve, but if you had to right now yeah. lay out your next five, ten years, yeah, how would you love it to go? It, it's all it's all about creating a franchise, and then cre- like so, you know, kind of the next year or two is really figuring out what are all the verticals which go- makes this go from a TV show to a full franchise. Pokemon, Star mm-hmm. Wars, you know, all the different Marvel IPs. They're not just doing shows. Shows sort of draw attention to a brand, but really the ways in which you can scale company scale its revenues are in verticals like merchandising um, video games um, Mm -hmm. doing graphic novels doing novels doing a lot of these other ancillary aspects of it so i think we really are going to focus on building out the ghost of ruin uh franchise as a whole over the next two years with Mm -hmm. these we're already working on graphic novel and video game and all these kind of other aspects and then once that's in motion to where we figured out all of these models and kind of how to create a great customer experience and also create great revenue on the business end. Then we uh, just, you know, really focus on, okay, now we're a studio. We've got a franchise model. Let's then take on new IPs to spin up franchises out of those. And this way, you know, we can become a, a, stu- a proper studio kind of like, you know, uh, another Walt Disney or another Lucasfilm or that. Yep. I wish nothing but the, you know, best of success. I can tell already you got your, you know, you got your eye on the prize, and I, I have no doubt this is gonna, you know, this is gonna make it somewhere. I, I, look, I, I look appreciate forward that. To the day that I could, uh, you know, that I could watch it. So I appreciate that. But I, I maybe the last thing I say is that the prize for me is the process. Like I, I enjoy every day that I wake up. Yeah. I, I'm not chasing honestly some particular target for revenue. It's not that that's not important, and certainly we, we've got that yeah. on a on a tertiary, yeah. secondary basis in my mind. But I really think that if you can pour your heart and soul into um, just creating something that's great for you, if your team also shares in that, if your customers share into that, then we know that whatever happens, because it's always going to be different to play yeah. out than what we envision, um, it's it's going to be a really good time. And you can look back on it that no matter what happens, like it it was it was a wild ride, and that's yeah. that's where we're at. It's How can people follow this and stay uh, up to date with what's going on with it? Yeah, we've got socials on all the platforms. It's it's Ghost of Ruin or Ghost of Ruin TV on like Twitter and YouTube and Instagram. Um, and yeah, we uh we'll, we're we're pushing out content every every week. Uh, so check check us out on socials and uh, hope you you watch the show when it comes out. I'm looking forward to it, PJ. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me and uh, nothing but continued success. Likewise, thanks so much, Mike. Hope you all and your right, listeners you. have a great day. Take care, See you it. too. Thanks for listening to Adeptus On Air. If you like this episode, please subscribe and leave a review. If you have a question related to this episode or have a request for what you would like to hear, please email us at marketing at adeptuscpas.com. You can also find us at adeptuscpas.com online or follow us at Adeptus on social media. The views and opinions by the podcast speakers and guests are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Adeptus. This podcast provides general information only and is not intended to constitute advice.